Welcome. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you may be joining us. My name is Avi Stamen, and I'm the CEO of Academic Language Experts. Academic Language Experts, or ALE for short, provides customized editing, grant writing, and publication support services to researchers, scientists, and other professionals to help them produce publication-ready texts at the highest levels. We also assist scholars looking for help with their book proposals prior to submission to their dream publisher, which we'll learn a lot more about today uh, with Jane. It's our mission to help our authors achieve publication success and be a, side, a source of guidance and support throughout their journey. Thank you for joining us for our 21st publication success interview, um, where I engage in conversation with innovative thought leaders in the world of academia about how they are influencing the world of research in the hopes of helping authors to better understand the publication landscape and build bridges between authors, publishers, and funding bodies. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Jane Jones, who's a develop, who is a development, developmental editor and academic writing coach at Upin Consulting. Jane Jones, PhD, is a writing coach and developmental editor who helps women academic authors transform their relationship with writing. She's a proud New Yorker, weekend bourbon drinker, and former tenure-track professor of sociology. Jane was once an overworked academic, um, hopefully not overworked anymore, under such intense stress that she developed a lactose intolerance. Eventually, after becoming disillusioned with the structural inequalities and what felt like outright hostile working conditions of her university, Jane left academia to found Up in Consulting, where she's been until today. In her six years as a developmental editor, she's worked with writers who have published books with presses, including University of Chicago, Oxford, Princeton University Press, NYU Press, and Bloomsbury. In fact, I believe that I originally was introduced to you through Princeton, so I can vouch for that. Um, go ahead and ask your questions on the Zoom chat, and we will try and answer them at the end of the session. If you have a more personal question or want to discuss your specific research, uh, feel free to reach out uh, to myself uh, following the interview. Also, um, Jane has a lot of resources and materials that she that we'll be sharing with you as well. This interview is being recorded, and we'll send it out over the next few days if, in case you want to rewatch any bits. So that is enough for me. Jane, um, so nice of you to join me today. Thank you so much. I really Thank appreciate you. You taking your time. Yeah. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah, really excited about this one because I think that we spend a lot of time talking tips and strategies and politics and, you know, um, and technical things, I would say. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm really excited to talk a little bit more, maybe a little bit more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, exposing ourselves a little bit and talking about the, a little bit more of the emotions or some of the uh, struggles that go into writing, which I think probably we all have, but maybe don't love to talk about in public. So, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, for sure. I really, yeah, I think that's really, really great. In. But before we, before we do that, maybe you can just start by telling me, you know, tell me a little bit more about that story that I read off there in the bio about you were on the academic track. Mm -hmm. um, you may, you know, you, you were in it, you already were an assistant professor. Um, you were heading towards tenure and something seemed to kind of tell you that this was not going to be the direction or the path mm -hmm. that you were going to take. So maybe you could just walk us through that a little bit and tell us about that story. Yeah, sure. So when I went on the job market in two, th and thank you again for having me. I'm really excited to talk to everybody about kind of what happened to me and then how I can help you. So when I went on the job market, it was 2000. Nine. So right after, you know, the recession and it was a tough job market and, you know, people were like, no one's getting jobs. Like I'm a qualitative re sociologist. I felt like the picking, you know, there were, there were definitely jobs, but I didn't feel particularly competitive. I didn't have publications, but I went on the job market and I got a job and I got a tenure track job outside of a city that I was really excited to live in, like close enough to commute home to see my family. And it seems great. Like I was really excited. I was like, this is a great thing that just happened to me. And I, you know, so I went to start the position and, you know, a lot, there were a lot of things there that grad school didn't prepare me for. It was a teaching intensive position. And I had taught in grad school, but, you know, we didn't have like formalized training around how to teach. So it was a lot of teaching, a lot of mentoring of students. So, and I'm sure we can all relate to just like the learning curve of starting a new job and feeling like you have to be, because we're all academic perfectionists in a way, like you have to be great from day one. 
like your courses have to be perfect, your syllabi have to be perfect, your students should be really excited in your class, like all of those things. So, you know, the pressures I felt, I think were pretty common, but they were exacerbated by some of the other things that were going on on campus. It was a, I was in a pretty conservative town. The campus itself was pretty conservative. There weren't a lot of black faculty members and those issues kind of compounded one on top of the other to make what was already a situation that was, you know, in some ways, just like I was saying, like a learning curve, which, you know, you think like, I can handle that. Like I need to improve my teaching. Like I need to tighten up my syllabi, but that compounded with everything else made it really hard to be there. So the kind of cut forward three years in, I considered going back on the job market to find maybe a different campus or get into a different geographic area. And I realized that that wouldn't guarantee that the problems that were really causing me a lot, that I perceive as causing me a lot of stress would disappear. So I was like, well, I don't know if going somewhere else is the solution. And now of course, like doing so much coaching and stuff, I realize retrospectively, I could have changed my thoughts about it or I could have changed my situation, right? So I decided to change my situation. And for me, that meant leaving my tenure track job. So I put in my resignation <laughs> and Did you know decided to go. go what are you going to? Go ahead. No, I was just curious whether you knew where you were headed when you handed in your resignation or you just were said, I'm going to, I know this is not for me, so I'm going to go and explore and whatever happens, so be it. I actually applied for a fellowship. So I was able to use that to get out of that institution, but also stay in the academy. And to be clear, there were some things about that institution I really enjoyed. Like I had some great colleagues and like, I don't want to make it sound like it was like, you know, the most awful place. On earth. It just wasn't for me, you know? So thinking of that, I was like, how can I kind of segue? Because I also had the thought, and this might sound Con, you know, this might resonate with people on call. Like if I leave this job and I decide I want to come back to academia, like that doesn't seem like something people do. You know, like it doesn't seem like you can leave and come back. So I was trying to be careful about how I planned my exit strategy, so to speak. So I was like, if I take a fellowship, that kind of softens it because I'm still in academia. Like it was an academic institution, like an academic organization that granted me this fellowship. And then I use that fellowship to kind of segue, <laughs> segue out. And then I started my business a year later. So when I sent in my resignation, it wasn't just, you know, let me jump out of this plane without a parachute. Like that's not what I did. I decided to, you know, kind of make the transition a little more I wanted it to be legible to people who were still in academia. Like that was important to me at that time. So, and the fellowship sounded very interesting and, you know, like something I wanted to do. So it was really good timing, I think. I want, I want to take you back to, to when you were still in the academic position. And, and you know, I, like you said, there's one of the challenges of academia is that there's so much going on and so many different things you really want to be good at. But I want to mm -hmm. focus our 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 conversation on on specifically on writing and I'm curious mm -hmm. did you feel like you had the time and the mind space to write I mean my guess is not <laughs> if, I, if, it, if it was too much and were there any resources that you can recall that were available or that kind of were made you know that you could you know latch on to or, or get help mm -hmm. from in order to progress your writing in order to speak out what you were working on or did you kind of feel like you were working on an island figuring stuff out yourself I definitely felt like I was working on an island and I tell the story a lot because it kind of, I think it's at the stage for what I do now, which is group coaching. So I, I remember I had this revise and resubmit that was on my desk for months, months. Like it was like an albatross. I'm like, I would look at it and I'd look away. <laughs> I'm like, this is, I got to work on this and I don't have time. So I realized, you know, like I have to get this done. Like if I don't, like I need a publication number one, 
And number two, like I want to publish. It's like, it's based on my dissertation. It's really interesting research to me. I'm like, I want to write this article and the revise and resubmit had really productive comments, you know, so I wanted to address them and I felt like I didn't have time. And, you know, the, the norm was work on your research in the summer. And I was like, that doesn't seem like it's going to work. I tried that the first summer, but there was also a lot of course prep to do in the summer because I was teaching new courses. I was, you know, like first, second year faculty. So I was like, I think I need to work on this during the year. <laughs> you know, like that's what my spidey senses are telling me. So what I ended up doing was joining an online writing group and it was not university affiliated. It was a business that convened writing groups. And when I joined that writing group and saw the other women who were in it, who were at institutions who were more like higher ranked than mine, like research universities and different types of institutions. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I'm not the only one who needs help, like who wants to write with other people, you know, because I felt a little bad, like, oh, I need this writing group. Like, it seems like my colleagues, you know, they're getting their writing done. Like I had a colleague who was great about like going into his office and shutting his door. You know, we all think we have a colleague. We don't know what they're doing behind their door. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like I was like, they're sitting there writing and like, I'm sitting here and I don't know what to do. And then I joined this group and I was like, oh, okay. And, we, and I remember we tracked our writing. Like you would literally like log in, track if you wrote that day and they had a tracker and there was also a discussion board and we'd all talk about what we were working on. And, you know, it wasn't, we never like met on a Zoom or anything. Like, I don't even know if Zoom existed in 2012. <laughs> you know, I'm sure Skype did, like it's not, you know. But we did everything kind of virtually through that discussion board. And I was able to finish my revise and resubmit. And I was like, this is amazing. Like I was able to finish, I got it done. I got it off my desk, it got published. And I was like, this is great. And I didn't even know that something like that existed. Like I was literally Googling like how to finish an article or, you know, like how to do a revise and resubmit and just stumbled upon it. And I was like, I need to try this because I need to do something. Like yeah, I need I, to do something. I wonder if looking backwards at that time period, you know, cause you, the first thing you said was, well, I simply didn't have time to, to deal with the revise mm -hmm. and resubmit. But then I hear, I'm, what I'm hearing now is you know, it wasn't may maybe time was an issue, but it was also a matter of the the, the environment or the headspace or the collegiality mm -hmm. that also helped you move forward. So I wonder, like, you know, I mean, not to take away the, from either one, but I wonder if maybe it's some sort of combination of the two, which actually, you know, kind of like it's easy to make excuses for ourselves because we do have so much going on to say, well, okay, I'll deal with the article later, but mm -hmm. maybe that's covering up for you know, some feeling of like, well, even when I do open that revise and resubmit, even if I think there's great comments there, I'm like scared that I don't know, I'm not mm -hmm. going to be able to really address them or I don't know how, where to start or, I, you know. I think that sometimes when we say I don't have time, what we really mean is I don't know. So, and we don't, but we don't know that's what we're doing, right? So we legitimately think we don't have time. You know, it's like, I, it's not like we're, being dishonest to ourselves, you know, it's that I think I don't have time because I don't know what to do with the time I have. So you kind of imagine this is going to, this is going to take so long. I don't know if anyone said that when I look at a revise and resubmit, this is going to take so long. And then you're like, okay, so then if I have like this limited amount of time today, because it's a day I'm not teaching, I don't know what to do with that time. So your brain's just like, well, you don't have time. Like, because you don't have as much time as you think you need, but in reality, you don't know how much time you need because you haven't really like sat down and assessed the project. So then it just becomes like panic. Okay. Yeah. So then we're just in a stage where we avoid and we're like, I don't have time. I can't get to it. There are all these other things on my plate, like you were saying, you know, and then all of the other things become the things that are more concrete like those papers that I need to grade, like I don't really want to grade them, but they're really obvious and I know how to do it. So yeah. I'm going to focus all of my attention there. Yeah. Because that's comfortable. Yeah. You know, and then doing the things that are 
less comfortable, like dealing with that revised resubmit, especially when you then don't have support those just seem like things you can't do. So your brain's like, you don't have time to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can recall so many conversations I had with junior scholars who didn't even understand the concept that revise and resubmit was a positive thing and would call me in crying saying, how did I get three pages of, of, of feedback and, and changes and edits and revisions? And, I, and I'm telling them that they should be like, you know, popping out the champagne bottles and saying like, <laughs> they took your research seriously. They sent it out to peer review, mm -hmm. you know, and you didn't get rejected, like, great, this is best case scenario. And for them, it's like, it's a different mindset. And I, and I think a lot of it comes from a lot of us, right, in this room, we, 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 we experience a, a lot of success, right, to become a PhD, mm -hmm. to become a postdoc, to get a position. You have to be, you know, intelligent. You have to be a hard worker. You have to have a passion for what you're doing. But then all of a sudden, like, we hit this brick wall where, you know, publishing an article is like 90% of people are getting rejected. Mm -hmm. And I think that we don't know, again, it's like divided between the technical don't know, but also the emotional don't know. It's like, well, you know, right? Like rejected. Does that mean that my research isn't good? Does that mean that I'm not a good researcher? Does that mean that I need to change, you know, like, like it's, it can spiral out of control mm -hmm. quite quickly. And I see this um, quite often. So I wonder, so I guess turning that into a question, I wonder kind of, how you made that, you, you know, that move from being in this place where you didn't feel like you were knowing, joining this group, and then thinking, not only can I overcome my own writing challenges, but maybe this mm -hmm. is something that I can help others with as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. So when I first started my business, I did not do group coaching. Okay. I did one-on-one -on -one editing primarily. And to your point, you know, people would have their writing and feel like, you know, this has to be perfect, or I got to revise and resubmit, and I don't know what to do. Like, can you help me with it? You know, so we did that type, I did that type of help, that type of editing help. But what I realized is that people were really overwhelmed, <laughs> you know, so they were not revising, you know, or they would say they would send me something and it wouldn't come. And I think it speaks to what you were just saying, Abby, like they were so, writers are so, you know, where we are like the A plus student. We are the person who did everything right, whose teachers loved us, whose professors thought we were, you know, brilliant in high school and undergrad, even in grad school sometimes. And then we get to this point where we're kind of left to our own devices to write. And it feels very, un you feel very unmoored. Because you're like, I don't have like a structure to do this in. I don't exactly know how to do it. You know, people get very varying, <laughs> very varying, like dramatically different levels of preparation for article, book, and grant writing in grad school. Dramatically different from zero to my advisor sat with me and helped me write articles. You know, like all over. Can I, can so I the point add, they get to, go I ahead. just want to add that there's also a dramatic variance when you get help between what people mean yeah. when they say editing, grant support, and mm -hmm. revising. Like what oh, those yeah. terms mean are totally, can go anywhere totally from different. ghostwrite it for me to I'm going to make sure that you're, that like there's no egregious errors and everything in between. So yeah, but continue. Yeah, yeah. So, so with that, but in the pre, like, in the pre-stage, like when you're actually writing it versus like the post-production stage, we're doing like editing and whatnot. Like in the pre-stage, clients would get so overwhelmed that they would just never send me anything. And I'm like, well, you said you were going to send me like your article. <laughs> and I've been waiting for it for two months and they just wouldn't like, and it wasn't because they were lazy. It wasn't because they were disorganized. It was because they literally were like scared to sit down and write. And my perspective was, I'm an editor. I'm not going to tell anybody what it says. It doesn't matter if it's the greatest thing you've ever written or, you know, like draft zero. You know, like my job is just to help you make it better. So if you're thinking like, if you're even feeling that level of embarrassment talking to an editor, think about how it would feel to send something out. 
to your peers. You know, so then that just becomes this thing that they're like, woof. So to kind of go back to your question about how that then became what I do now, I realize I'm like, people need coaching <laughs> because there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of issues. There were issues of project management. Like, how do I get this article done? And I'm also have to write a book, you know, because I need a book and five articles to get tenure at my institution, you know? So there was the project management level of it. And there was also the emotional management of, you know, like you said, like I got rejected and I don't know what to do. Like I've never got rejected from anything before in my entire life. Like I'm a failure. I'm, I'm going to lose my job. And it's like, no, you're not, <laughs> you know, let's take a step and really like think about what we can do here. So the coaching kind of grew organically out of the editing. And then I decided that people really needed both of them at the same time. So then the editing became more of a teaching, like teaching people how to write alongside the coaching. And that's what I do now. So now when people work with me, they have to get both. Like you can't get one or the other. We do like craft of writing and coaching. Got it. At the same time. All right. I want to, I want to move now, now that we have like, you know, uh, you know, really, I think a nice portrait, uh, you know, at least in a, in a suit, you know, in a, on a basic level of, of your journey um, to talk about, you know, what does this editing coaching process look like in your eyes, um, you know, in an ideal in an ideal world. Now, obviously everyone has different struggles and everyone has different challenges, mm -hmm. but maybe you, can you identify for us, maybe, you know, I don't know, three or four of like the most common sort of basic challenges that, 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 that you see, that you see mm -hmm. junior scholars facing and what steps you take with them or what steps you would suggest for them to take in mm -hmm. order to, start and, you know, maybe identify and then kind of um, uh, start to tackle their, their challenges. Okay. So like top three things they face is what you're asking. Yeah. Why not? Okay. Okay. Just want to make sure I'm yeah. answering the question. Um, all right. So I'm like, that's a big one because you come <laughs> to me with a lot of different things. For you start with, with you start with one or two. <laughs> But I mean, I do work with a lot of people, but you know, the problems kind of coalesce around a couple of things. So I would say one of the top is I don't know how long I need to do this. That's a question I get. That's a struggle I get all the time. I thought this chapter would take me two months and it took me six months. That's very common, not knowing how much time you need to complete a project. So I would say the time issue. And I'm going to do one kind of like from every category that I work in, just to kind of make it clear. Another one is comparison. Time Everyone's is like, working faster than I am. Time is like- The time is kind of like project management. Project management. Okay. That's what I want. I don't to know say. how much time I need. Makes sense. Then if we get into more of like mindset, you know, imposter syndrome comparison, everyone's writing faster than I am. Everyone's publishing more than I am. This person spoke to- the editor at Chicago once and got a contract, whatever it is they're perceiving, right? So comparison. And then actually craft, like the, like the technique of writing. So right now I work with book writers. I've worked with article writers in the past. Like I have a course on how to write an article and the idea is just like, I have all this data. I have this amazing analysis. Like I have this great story. How do I put it into an article? How do I put it into a book? Like how do I form, formulate my big book sized argument and then develop like the through line or, you know, I've written thousands and thousands of words and now I need to like organize it into a cohesive manuscript. And people don't, academics struggle with doing that because it's not taught or it's taught in various degrees, to various ends, you know? So I would say those are three really big issues that people come to me 
for. And then we figure out how to answer them because they're not the same for everybody. People come with different levels of preparation. You know, people come with different project management skills. You know, some people's comparison or like feelings of imposter syndrome have very different origins. So, you know, it's not a one size, like I can give you advice that's gonna work for every single person. Yeah, no, okay. No, I know so, you're not saying that. Like, me, I just no, wanna no. like, you know. This is really but, helpful. You know, this is really helpful. And I actually think, I actually think that we should, I want to stick on this for a minute um, and I'm going to, I'm going to push back a little bit because I think that really the way you've identified these three, I've never heard it identified as clearly and as coherently. And, and I've been in this industry for a long time. So I want you to, to tell me what is your, either what's the first step that you take to address mm-hmm. the project management, the imposter syndrome and, you know, the, the sort of writing coherence or mm-hmm. writing, writing skills, or what is your general approach for attacking? Or if you were to be, you know, if I were to ask you, if I were that scholar, who were asking you one of those three questions, what would your, what's the first step? You know, I know that you can't give us the whole course now and, you know, on no, in okay. the next 10 minutes, but what's the mm-hmm. first thing that, that, that you recommend to do to kind of, you know, get your feet wet and jump in? Yeah. So for me, you know, it's, I do, I work kind of counterintuitively because I think people are really attracted to working on the project management first because there's a lot out there for that. So it's like, I can use an app, I can calendar, I can do Pomodoros, you know, like all of this stuff. Whereas the other two, you know, the comparison in mindset, like, like we were saying, I mean, I think we talked about this before in our initial call, like mental health and just feelings like imposter syndrome and all of those are becoming more discussed in the academy, but people still hesitate to lead with that when they talk to a coach like myself. Some people are, but most people express the either the time or the craft issue first. You know, so normally we start and because of that, I normally start with craft when I talk to people because that's what they feel very, a lot of urgency around. I need to write this, you know, and they do because tenure is hard <laughs> and there's a lot of pressure. So we tend to start there with, you know, figuring out what are some of the, like the principles of writing that we need to deal with. So like we teach some writing principles, especially around book writing. And then we get more into the mindset and the project management after we start with some of that writing, because the writing will expose the comparison issues is what I notice because people will start writing and they'll be like, oh, I'm scared to write this. Mm. Oh, this is wrong. So it becomes kind of a a springboard to get into some of what I broadly call mindset, which encompasses so much more, you know, but the writing can bring us there. Or at least that's what I find. And then the project management comes last. And, you know, we deal with, because that also is partially mindset, the idea like, I don't have enough time. This is overwhelming. I have so many other things to do. You know, so project management and mindset are really go hand in hand, in my opinion, but we start with the writing. Interesting. And maybe you could just give us a little bit of a, of a, you know, window into someone who joins this group. Like, what does that Mm -hmm. look like? Are they sharing at an early stage their writing with other folks? Are they sharing it with you? How do you create that environment and space where people feel like, mm-hmm. you know what, I can, I can expose my writing without, you know, feeling like, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, showing you something that's private that I'm embarrassed about. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, we, you know, we create this space and what we do is we're really deliberate about like when we ask them to share and how we ask them to share. So there's a curriculum that we follow and everyone in the program is required to follow it. So we have certain milestones where we're prepping you to share your writing so that by the time 
you share it, you've already had some training and example and opportunities to talk about it. So when you share it, sometimes you're sharing it in a way that is workshoppy where other people are talking to you about it. And sometimes you're sharing it where only the editors are looking at it. So it's never like a full, like I'm exposing this to the world type thing because it, you know, like we're not about like throwing you into the deep end of the pool as soon as you join. <laughs> Like so that's not therapy. Yeah, I got it. That we we don't do immersion therapy. We don't do exposure therapy. You know, <laughs> I'm not a therapist, but um, we don't do that. Like it's not like those like those shows where like they put the snakes on people and they're like, well, now you're not scared of snakes anymore. Like, no, we don't do any of that. <laughs> so it's about prep, you know. And as academics, you know, where we like to learn things, and it's not unique to academia. Plenty of things people love to learn things, but you know. You feel safer, I think, when you're like, okay, I've had an opportunity to learn how to do this. Like I've gotten these instructions, like we've been through a workshop. I've had, you know, like these worksheets to work with and now I'm going to share it. And we're very much like share your, what you perceive, like this is not the language that I would use, but what you perceive to be your worst version. Like we don't care. I'm like, show us whatever it is, you can show us like it doesn't have to be perfect because we do get that pushback it's not ready to share yet I can't share it with you yet I have to do this one more thing so we just set deadlines and we say if you don't send it to us by this date we're we're gonna come and ask you for it and you have to you know we kind of make it a a non-negotiable in the program Sounds and like most people do it once or twice we almost uniformly hear this was this was not as bad as I thought. This was not bad. Like I thought this was going to be awful. You know, they think they're going against like the panel. You know, I'm like, this is not, you know, like one of those cooking shows where they like throw your food back at you. Like, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> yeah. 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 The you know, way there's I no just... Gordon Ramsay here. Like, we're good, you know. So yeah. kind of building it... that trust so that then you can share. You know, because there needs to be trust there. Yeah. Yeah. The way I describe, you know, when, when to, to my staff, when we talk about our role um, with researcher services and author services to authors is I like to describe it as like the silent partner. It's like having like, you know, mm -hmm. the silent, um, you know, this, this superpower, but no one else knows about it except for you. And you can use it when, you know, when, when you, when it's right for you and when it helps you. Um, and and it's not, you know, and, 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 and then some people, sometimes people will say, well, it's supposed to be my work. Well, yeah, of course it's, it's entirely your work. The fact that you are growing in your own work through having others and colleagues to help you does not in any way take away from ownership and authority. And in fact, that's one of our principles is you need to take ownership and responsibility for your work. And it sounds like you're saying the same thing, right? Because I know, you know, you probably have had this case before. I know I've had it many times where people come to us and they think that a writing coach is a ghostwriter and there couldn't be two things that are further, you know, the way I see it, it's like two ends of the spectrum. Like you're coming here to work, right? Like we're going to make you work, work your butt off. Um, not, this is not yeah. where something where you're getting some sort of, you know, and, and, and in fact, sometimes we get, you know, in general writing, you know, writing help, they think, you know, um, you have to be very careful because um, people, there is a whole sort of, I don't know, black market industry out there that, you know, sells rubbish. Um, so it's, um, so yeah. I, I think, I think it's like really kind of important to define what we're doing in a very, in a very clear way. Now I want to, I yeah, want to, sure. I think if I can just add one, yeah, please. one note there, when I did, when I used to do one-on-one -on -one coaching, I did primarily academics and a novelist found me somehow. And I was like, I, I guess I can help you. Like I not editing, but more of the coaching, like let's set up a plan, let's set up a project. And she would tell me about these readings she went to. And I knew about them in a, a kind of, you know, three times removed way because I've never written fiction. But, you know, like she would go and like read just one scene from a chapter and they would talk about it. And that idea really put a spark away for what you're, you know, to what you're talking about that it's, you know, sometimes we focus so much on the final product in editing or academics, like, well, I can go to a copy editor and they can look at it at the end. And having that iterative help at the beginning does not mean someone's doing the work for you. 
it means that, like you were saying, like with fear of like ghostwriting or anything like that, like it doesn't mean someone's doing the work for you. All other authors do this already. You know, like they share their work in community with other people in early stages. You know, it's academia where we feel like we have to be at some arbitrary point of completion before we can ever talk to anybody about our work. And that really stifles us because we're sitting there by ourselves with only our brain that's been staring at the same thing for six months. And we're like, well, what do I do? Well, of course you don't know what to do. Because you've been sitting there staring at the same thing for six months and not talking to anyone about it. You know, so we have to get out of that that idea that that's the way to do work. Like it really romanticizes this like, you know, Pasteurian almost like, like Latourian rather like one genius man or person who's like, you know, working away by himself and emerges with this masterpiece. And like, that's just not the way things are created in the world. Yeah. You know, so, and saying that somehow getting help is disingenuous or cheating you know, is really problematic. Like we, we work best in community. Yeah. So yeah, I'll get off my soapbox. No, but like, I think that's really important to emphasize. You're totally right. You're totally right. I think it's a combination of, of everything that you're saying now and the fact that we're worried about someone else running off with our research, which, mm-hmm. you know, I, I always struggle when people ask when, when, because I always encourage people, I say, send it to colleagues, send it to reviewers, even after we do work on it. Like, Every intelligent, my, my, my opinion is every intelligent reader can contribute something to your, to your reading. Even if they're not from your field, they can contribute yeah. something of value and of worth. So when someone comes to me afterwards and said, well, you edited it and now I sent it to another editor and, and they, they change things as well. I say, great, right? They're expecting me to say, to like, you know, get very defensive and say, well, <laughs> no, everything should be perfect by the time we're done. And I say, no, that's great. Like send it to as many people. Now, but I, I do think there's a fear of, well, if I send it to someone, maybe they'll rip me off. And there have been cases. So it's a, it, it's a yeah. challenge. I don't necessarily have a great response to them because I do want to encourage people to be as collaborative as possible. My advice is always try, and, and maybe with a writing coach, it doesn't work that way. But with your colleagues, try and make it a two-way street. If you find yourself continually asking your advisor, your, your, your colleague, help me, help me, help me, and you're not helping them. So there may be a tendency, there may be a feeling of, okay, well, this isn't like, you know, equal value. But if you, if you believe in yourself that you say, I, I know enough that I can, you know, at least critique someone else's writing, right? It's much easier for us to critique others than it is to, mm-hmm. to write ourselves. And they're helping us and we're helping them. So then I think it creates this environment, you know, and definitely on a group setting that can be so beneficial and positive. Um, but, but you're yeah. right, we have to get over this isolation that we sort of either whether it's self-imposed or imposed by the way that academia is set up. I mean, I think it's, it, it really is set up by academia purposely or not. Um, yeah. But, but, you know, I think, you know, sometimes we're our, our own worst enemy in that sense. Yeah, for sure. And I totally, I completely agree with the fear, you know, people have of being like scooped or plagiarized or unsighted fairly. Like I've had clients who have experienced that, particularly black women I work with who have been like, you know, their work has been used without being cited. Like there's a whole movement within academia, like to make sure that people's work is recognized. And I think that's really important to point out. And you know, that's a fear you have. I don't think it should prevent you from sharing with anyone. You know, like we have to be judicious. And also there are ways to write with people without sharing your work. You know, like for instance, the writing group I was in when I was a junior track, a tenure track junior, you know, we came together to write, but we didn't read each other's work. And it helped immensely, you know, because we were just in community and we would talk like, oh, this is what I'm working on. But it was really to just like the solidarity and camaraderie around having someone to work with, you know, so, which could be really I'm curious helpful, how did that just work? To feel like, how, how did that? How did it work technically like, or like how doing? did it help? Yeah, technically, like what were- <laughs> Do, what were you, you came to these sessions, you weren't sharing work with each other, but how are you helping each other without reading each other's work? How did that work? So we were saying like, you know, today I am setting aside like this hour to write and this is what I want to do. And people would be like, okay, and they give you like words of encouragement or they'd say, I'm spending this hour too. We would track our times. So there'd be a leaderboard. We would set goals like let's, for instance, 
let's collectively try to write for this many minutes this week. So people would put in their goals and we really try to make that outcome by the end of the week, which meant, you know, like showing up at the times you promised to show up, which, you know, can help you with accountability if that's something you need help with. So just being in that community and realizing there are other people also working and other people who are really committing. So it really helped with feeling isolated. It helped with, there are other people who are also making this commitment when I'm making it. So again, like helping with isolation, accountability, like I said, and also just, you know, community, like getting to know people and be like, oh, you know, you're in this university. How do you like it there? You know, and just kind of building friendly relationships with the people in the group. Right. Great. Um, one of the things that you, that I, that we noticed, you know, that you, you write a lot about is breaking your writing down into bite-sized pieces. Um, and I'm not sure whether this is more the writing itself or the project management. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about, you know, I think we all know what that means in a generic, in a general sense, but what, it, how do you define that? And how do you recommend to scholars to go about doing that? It's a good question. I've been talk. that's been like my new, it's not new, but I always come back to it because <laughs> it's always hard. Um, what I mean is we we romanticize really long stretches of writing. Like I need two hours, I need four hours, I need a whole day to work on my book. Mm. And the reality is that most, the majority, I mean, I can ask in the chat, like how many of you have upwards of two hours more than once a week to sit and work on your writing? If you wanna answer that, I'd love to see that answer in the chat. Two or more hours, more than once a week to work on your writing. chat is silent so <laughs> I'm guessing that most people don't so when you don't have that amount of time how do you get writing done and I just said two hours that seems to be something that resonates with people and if you don't have that time how do you write you don't just say I can't write this week so what I like to advocate for is like not necessarily writing every day, because I know that's not realistic for a lot of people, but like constant touches of your writing so that when you do have those longer periods of time, you can actually write and not like reacclimate yourself to the writing. So when we break things into tasks, we want them to be so doable that you can complete them in like half an hour, half an hour, 45 minutes. So that's where we orient the small tasks and then we figure out what they are. So in order to figure out what they are, you kind of have to know what you're writing about. So that's why, as I was saying before, like project management normally comes after we do some writing. So you could see like, okay, well, this is what needs to go into this chapter or I know I need to revise this section or I know I need to add more data here because there's not enough yet. So once you're able to get to that point, you be, you can begin to figure out the specific small tasks that you can do. And some of them are very repetitive, like add more data, read this article, <laughs> you know, look at these four abstracts and decide if you're going to read these articles. You know, so some of them are very repetitive and you can kind of have them at the ready so that you're not constantly planning, which is what people sometimes get nervous about. Like I'm going to spend so much time planning that I'm never gonna write. It's like, no, you're just building a really good foundation for writing. So that when you do write, you have a really clear agenda. So yeah, the tasks need to be doable within 30 minutes and they can be writing related, they can be research related, you know, and you figure them out, you know, as you're developing your ideas. So it's not like you can sit and make that list before you start writing. You might be able to make some of it, but it will grow as you write. And then you map it onto your calendar and do, do the things. What about an author who comes to the, you know, sits down at their computer and just has this 
you know, periods of writing writer's block or freeze where they just, they just can't manage to get their thoughts down on paper. Every time they try, they end up, you know, kind of deleting and starting again. And, Mm -hmm. you know, even if they break it down into bite-sized chunks, simply don't feel like they're making progress with their work. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes when you feel like you're not making progress, you are making progress. So we would definitely assess that. (laughs) You know, you feel like you're not making progress, but are you really? We would generally encourage, you know, if you're sitting at your screen, like like you said, like literally sitting at your screen, you feel like you can't get words out on the keyboard, then you may just need a different method. So maybe you need to voice memo, maybe you need to write on pen and paper, maybe you need to talk to somebody. And if you're in a group, then talk to somebody in the group, like in our program, you'll talk to us. Mm -hmm. And we would help you, you know, so figure out what is it that you're like, and also figure out like, where is the stuck? And that requires some introspection. So, you know, if you're sitting there deleting, deleting, like we had an an occurrence like this, or someone was deleting, 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 and what it turned out being, and this is pretty common, so it was not unique to this person, I don't want to say like, I'm like exposing one person in our group, but you know, like, I'm scared to write this on paper. Like I'm scared. I'm scared of people are going to critique this. So you don't want to write it. So you're writing and you're deleting it. You're writing and you're deleting it. You're trying to say it in a more amenable way. Right. So maybe that might be it. Maybe you aren't like you logistically, like don't know how to say it. Okay, so then let's talk about it. Because normally when people talk things out, they can figure it out, right? So when they're sitting there and they're stuck with that, you know, what we call writer's block, we have to get to the source of what it is. Sometimes you're just really tired and stressed out and it's not the right time for you to write. And that's okay too. And you need to get up and go for a walk or have a cup of tea and try again. Like sometimes that's the answer. Yeah, I don't, it's funny because I, I, there have been there, you know, I've had this a few times and I don't think there was ever a time where, you know, whenever I change location to some place that I get some sort of, in, you know, inspiration from, even if it's five minutes from my house, but I'm looking at like the mountains instead of looking at like the computer screen, I find that that all like that in and of itself can mm-hmm. totally, you know, kind of re- reframe the way that that I'm looking at things. All right, there we've got a lot of topics left, but I, we're, I, I, I'm, I'm sense, I'm aware of the time, sense of the time, and this has been really great, and you're chock full of really helpful and, and interesting insights, and and really important insights as well. Thank you. Um, but before we do, before we open it up to everyone, I do want to, and and anyone who has questions should feel free um, to uh, to jump in on the chat, and also we're going to open it up. Um, here to anyone who wants to, to jump in. We're a nice, a nice, um, you know, intimate group today. Um, but I do want to ask you, you know, short of um, joining Jane's, uh, you know, um, consulting groups, which I highly recommend everyone to do. What do you, what would you say, you know, for scholars who are looking for those groups or are mm-hmm. looking for the support within their own institution, where do you recommend starting? Where should people look to? Is it writing centers Is it, you know, a group of similar aged or similar stage, you know, colleagues? Like, how do you recommend Mm -hmm. even starting the process? I mean, you said you just Googled and, you know, sort of fell into your writing group. But, you know, I'm hoping that since, you know, since 2012, maybe things have gotten a little bit better. I hope so. I really hope so. (laughs) I would say on campuses, you know, a lot of campuses have offices of faculty development. And that's where you would want to go. Or if there's a dean of research. If you want to start from kind of like a university like sponsored group, that might be, or like the dean of faculty, that might be where you want to go. But I think you could start way more organically with, you know, people you are friendly with on your campus. They don't have to be in your discipline. You know, it might be a group of parents because parents tend to have like unique obstacles to writing, you know, in terms of timing and and, you know, they're not that unique because there are so many parents, you know, but like, so maybe you join your group around some commonality outside of your research, right? Because if it's going to be like a campus-wide thing, the commonality is probably not going to be research, you know, so, or maybe it's just people you're friendly with and you're like, let's get together on campus and write in the library or like write 
and you're like, let's reserve a room, like let's reserve a classroom and write in it for a couple of hours. It doesn't have to be hard. I think just making it as easy as possible is the best way to start and, you know, put together a schedule, get four or five people to commit to it, and then just go, you know, like don't, we tend to want to overthink things and make them more complicated than they have to be. And you can, you know, evolve your writing group as it goes on. But at the beginning, you could start with, we're going to get together and write, or we're going to get together and talk about our research over coffee. You know, maybe we're not even writing. Maybe we're just chatting for the first couple of meetings. You yeah, know, that's like, a really good... make the barrier to entry really low. That's a really good point as well about the talking about it before you write it. Because I think that a lot of times researchers, you know, the ideas are sophisticated and complex and require thought and writing, you know, I mean, writing can come in different, different parts at different times for different scholars, but having, you know, the clearer you are in your own thought, you know, the easier it'll be to kind of translate that into writing um, as opposed to maybe, maybe sometimes the writing block comes from a place of saying, I'm not entirely sure I've teased out this, you know, this idea mm -hmm. from start to finish. And even if I do write it, it might not be where I want it to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Brilliant. All right. Um, Jane, this has been great. Um, we're not, we're not saying goodbye just yet because we want to open it up uh, to a quick Q and A, but um, before we do um, want to encourage everyone, first of all, if anyone is, um, is interested in our monthly events. Um, as we said that we do this once a month, um, our publication success interview series um, coming up uh, next month, I believe towards the end of October, um, we are interviewing uh, the editor in chief at the Lancet um, Journal, uh, who is going to be talking to us about how journals determine which uh, research topics they're actually interested in and want to publish about, which I think is um, should be a really interesting topic. Um, we also have a monthly series uh, with Gareth Dyke from Research Square, um, where we're going to be talking about uh, we're going to be talking about how to put together a strong research question and how to formulate your research question in an active way. So, highly encourage you to check that out and register for our upcoming events. Um, in addition, if anyone would like to, to learn more either about um, the services that Academic Language Experts provides or any of the um, coaching groups uh, and consulting services that Jane provides, um, you can be you can check out our website, check out uh, Jane's website. Um, I love working with people who do something that is really, really valuable, but a little bit out of our own expertise. So it's like we can really kind of um, work, work together in an ideal way. And I really think that that, you know, you, you really hit a spot, which to me is super, super important and critical um, and can really help people not just publish their research, right? Whenever, whenever we hire a new employee, I say, we're not here to help people publish their research. They may think that's why they're coming to us. But actually, for most of us, our research is really important to us. And we really want it to make an impact. We really want it to leave an impression. And we're here to help people achieve that. And I think that from everything I've heard today from you, Jane, like that's really kind of your mission as well. It's like, let's make mm -hmm. sure that you grow through your writing and not just that you get the check mark so you can get the promotion. Um, because we spend so much of our academic careers writing that if we hate every minute of it, we're basically going to hate our jobs, right? Like, yeah, we're going to hate our jobs. And also, you know, with books, because that's what I coach on, you know, you can't, you can't white knuckle your way through a book. It's too long, you know, so you can't do that kind of like, I'm just going to will myself to finish this type situation for, you know, an 80,000, 100,000 word manuscript. You know, it's, it's, it's just not going to work. So, yeah. And, and, and I'll, and I'll also say that, 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 you know, those who embrace the editorial and revisions process and really, you know, learn to, to enjoy it and, and to love it can really, you know, learn a lot and grow from, from that process. All right. I, we've been, we've been speaking for long enough. I do want to open it up. Um, um, I know, uh, a friend asked a question. I don't know if we, uh, you know, successfully address that question or not, you're welcome to, uh, you're welcome to, to, to chime in, or if anyone else wants to kind of um, raise their hand or open up their microphone, you're welcome to, this is, this is your opportunity to ask Jane any, anything that's on your mind. Yeah. 
Also for writing groups, I'd recommend, I would say, you know, academic Twitter is really where <laughs> you can find some good resources. I would say, you know, it feels weird recommending a social media platform to find a writing group, but that's where there's a lot of activity where yeah. people, you know, promote their groups or invite people to write. And, you know, people seem to find it very productive. So I would say if your institution does not offer things, go look there. Right. Thank you. You all have answered my question, so I wouldn't ask it. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Great. Thanks, Alpena. Anyone else want to chime in? All right, Mark asks, aside from informal rec recommendations, any suggestions for where to search for, reach out and contact developmental editors by field? For example, I'm an anthropologist. I'll just, I'll just I just wanna, I don't wanna answer this question. I want you to answer this, Jane. I just do, I do wanna say, sometimes I feel like the, the, the people that we should be turning to for help should be somewhat like qualitative research. It's like, you wanna be one step in, one step out. To have someone who sits next door to you you know, sometimes they can't see the forest from the trees because they are so in the field. To have someone who's in a totally different field that doesn't get what you're talking about can also be a problem. So you have to find the right balance there. But Jane, I'm curious mm -hmm. to hear from you, like technically where to, you know, someone wants to find someone who's, you know, do they need someone in their field? And if so, how do they go about finding them? I don't think you need someone in your field. When I edited like one-on-one, -on -one, I would say maybe, you know, a good portion of my clients were sociologists because I'm a sociologist and I knew them, you know, so like that was where there was a lot of name recognition. But if we think of, you know, the program I run now, Elevate, I'd say 80% of the clients aren't sociologists. You know, you want a smart person who's going to ask you the right questions and also understand like what a manuscript should look like. You know, so I think where you want to focus on specialization is in the type of manuscript you're preparing. So do I want someone who really knows how to write articles? Do I want an editor who's really well-versed in how to edit books? Do I want an editor who knows how to write grant proposals, which are book proposals, which are very different? You know, so I would say that's where you want to think about their experience and then the subject matter would come second in my opinion yeah thank you um last time for one more question anyone else want to jump in all right well we're just on time um jane this has been really really insightful and yeah it's been great and you know i know i'm i'm i'm, I'm sort of beating a drum, you know, uh, already, but I, I really think that this is, you know, a chance for transformative change um, at, in, in writing. And, and when that's, and, and a big part of what we're doing is, is writing. And I think it's, you know, it, if only, you know, one person in the session falls in love with writing as a, as a result of, of, of our talk, I think it was well worth it. Um, so, yeah. you know, thanks to you for taking the time. Thanks to everyone for coming out and joining yeah, us. Yeah, thank you to everyone. Yeah. And it's been great. So yeah, take care, everybody. And um, we hope to see you at, at our at our upcoming events. Bye. Bye bye now. <laughs>